that's what you were going to do. And it looked what God did. Isn't that great? You know, that's, that's true of me. That's really true of all of us. We don't know what God's going to do with us. You just follow him a step at a time and look what God does. I tell you, God will make you look good if you just keep following him. But we get in the way. Our mind gets in the way and we mess things up when we start leaning to our own understanding. But I tell you, if you just follow the Lord, God is a big God. He's got big plans for every one of us. And I tell you, he's got a great plan for every single one of you. There's not a single person that's a mistake. Whether your parents knew that you were coming or not, God knew. And Psalms 139, when all of your parts were still unformed in your mother's womb, he had a plan already written out for you what your life would be. That doesn't mean that he controls it and makes it come to pass, but he has a plan for you. And if you'll cooperate, I can guarantee you God's plans for you are better than your plans for yourself. I believe that for every single one of us. Amen. And I tell you, God loves the world. He loves the world. He wants us to reach out and touch people. And it's just so exciting to see what Joe and Tess are doing and, and the way that they're touching your lives. And then I know that you are going out and that you're touching lives. And that's what it's all about. Man, God is looking for a family, looking for people. So that's awesome. Praise the Lord. You know, I've debated a lot, but what I'm going to do tonight is share with you about some things that we're going through right now. Actually, many of you, I don't know how many of you, but many of you are students and familiar with our ministry and stuff. And we're going through some things right now. And I've had some people come up. You know, sometimes when we meet together, uh, the pressures of the world and things like this bother us. And so when we come together, it's kind of an escape. And I'm not saying that that's 100% wrong because, man, I think that the early church, you know, they were being persecuted mercilessly and they came together and they fellowshiped with each other and encouraged each other. And I'm sure that it was just like a little bit of heaven on earth compared to the things that they went through. So, yes, we need to do that. But also, you know, this nation was founded on ministers that preach the word of God and they preach messages that applied to the situations, the current situations. You know, David Barton has become a friend of mine and he's shown me uh, sermons when I went to his museum and he showed me sermons that every time they had an earthquake, the preachers would preach on what earthquakes mean and what the Bible has to say about earthquakes or if there was a flood or if there was a pandemic or if there was whatever. They would preach on it. And because of this, the people that started this nation had a biblical uh, perspective on everything that was happening. And one of the things that the more I'm getting involved in speaking out on things, I'm finding out that there's a lot of Christians that somehow or another they think about heaven and hell issues and they might think about marriage and how they can walk in love towards their mate or something, but they don't apply a lot of the truths of the word of God to the situation that they live in. And that's the responsibility, or you could say the blame of ministers that we haven't been ministering on things. So anyway, what I want to do is to uh, talk about some things about how should Christians get involved in, um, you know, I don't know, politics is the right word, but how should Christians respond or what is a biblical response of a Christian to the culture that we live in. And there needs to be some introduction to this because sometimes I've had people come and say, well, you know, in the Bible they didn't do anything. Well, there's a, there's a lot of differences. For one thing, they didn't have a nation that was founded on biblical principles and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Man, they had things that were just totally different than what we see. And, you know, I respect people... From other nations, I was out to eat with some people that uh, came from another nation and we were talking about some of these things. And uh, I respect them and they've talked about that they had godly kings and that they dedicated that nation to the Lord and things. And I respect that. And I know that there's been good people in all of these nations. The United States isn't unique in that sense. God has always touched people all around the world. But the United States is unique in this sense. 
that when, like say for instance, a godly king, a godly monarch might have done some good things, but when they died, the system was still a monarchy. And whoever came in, if they turned out to be a tyrant, they used that system to oppress people and to do things. This nation is the only nation that makes a statement that we derive all of our powers from God to the people and then the government is actually working for us. We're the kings in the United States. And our founding fathers established this nation on these biblical principles. Matter of fact, uh, I could give you quotes here, but I, I want to get into some other things. But there are actually uh, quotes from our founding fathers that they used Israel as a model of how to establish this nation. They used scripture. There were hundreds of times that sermons that had been preached were quoted and applied in the Declaration and in the Constitution. I mean, hundreds of references to it. This is a Christian nation. It was established on Christian principles. So in that sense, we have something different that other people haven't had. And that is that God gave us liberties and freedoms that the Apostle Paul, Peter, and these people didn't have. And we have been given a gift. And you know, I was just reading John Adams, the first vice president under George Washington and uh, the second president of the United States. And he said that future generations will never know the price that we paid for your freedom. And he says, if you don't make good use of it, I'm going to repent in heaven that I ever went to half of the effort that I did. And you know what? We need to understand some of these things that God has given us. So many of you know that, you know, we've filed a lawsuit against these uh, restrictions and uh, with the virus and all of the things specifically about that, you know, we have a First Amendment right that says that the government will not make any laws restricting our free freedom to assemble and uh, our freedom of religion and the exercise thereof. And our government has done that. I mean, they'll leave open the, the beer halls. They'll leave open the marijuana joints. They'll leave open the liquor stores. You, if we call this a protest today, nobody could say a thing. And they encourage protests. So this is a peaceful protest tonight. Amen. But they have, they have taken away our rights to have more than 175 people and then all of these other restrictions and stuff. And it is just completely uh, wrong. You know, last week we were, we, uh, were told that uh, we had to cease and desist our meeting. And uh, I had... Mark Baisley, who is our um, House representative from this district here in Colorado for the state uh, representative, and he called me and thanked me for putting in a lawsuit. And he said, man, you're doing the right thing. And he told me that all of the Republicans in the House, the state House, have filed a lawsuit against the governor. And uh, it's on the basis... They aren't doing it from the First Amendment, right? But it's on the basis that the government has been given executive powers in a case of emergency to do something for 30 days. Like if there was a fire raging, he could cause a mandatory evacuation if there's a flood or something like that or a pandemic. And so for 30 days, he has authorization to do that. And under extreme cases, he could extend it for 30 days. But that's a total of 60 days. It's now been six months. And the Republican uh, uh, House representatives are rising up and saying this is unconstitutional. He's, he's ruling like a king. And he he's just gave the word last week that he's going to extend it another 30 days. And he's implied that he may have restrictions until there is a cure for COVID-19, which I just heard a thing this week that they said this is something that's not going to ebb and flow like the virus or the flu. It's going to be here forever. Technically, they could just keep extending this thing. When are we going to stand up and do something? So I know that most of you agree with those things, but how do you square this with Scripture? People will take some Scriptures and say things, but you know, we're just supposed to turn the other cheek. We're not supposed to resist evil. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus was speaking. 
But you put that together with James chapter 4, verse 7, where it says, uh, Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen. Some people have taken things that Christians are just supposed to be totally passive, that we aren't supposed to uh, do anything that would be contrary. Matter of fact, the reason we're meeting in this building tonight is because there are Christians that believe that way and they don't support what we're doing. And I don't know them, but I imagine they're, they probably love the Lord and they're probably good people. But there are people that think that Christians are just supposed to uh, go with the flow and never say or do anything. And they think that that is a scriptural stance. Let me share some scriptures with you out of 1 Peter chapter 2. And of course, this is Peter that's speaking. And in verse 13, he says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. And there are some people that will take this and say, that, well, then this just means that you are supposed to do whatever you're told to do. You're supposed to submit to every ordinance of man. And then it says, or unto governors as unto those that are sent by them. So are we supposed to submit or not? Well, let me take the very author here, Peter, and look over here in Acts chapter Four. This is right after they had seen the man in Acts chapter 3, the lame man that was healed. And uh, when the people saw that he had been healed, he was the one that was begging at the gate of the temple. Man, thousands of people came rushing together and Peter preached a sermon and there were 5,000 people saved at this uh, sermon that Peter gave. And when the scribes and Pharisees heard that they were preaching, and doing these things, they uh, arrested them and they brought them before them and began to start telling them that they could not uh, preach in the name of the Lord. And um, anyway, there's, a, there's some great things here. Uh, Peter, he didn't cut them any slack. Peter said, you are the ones that took Jesus and crucified him. And he, God raised him from the dead and he blamed them and and spoke to them in words that a lot of people would think, well, that's contrary to what 1 Peter chapter 2 says. But Peter's one who did this. And then look at this down in verse uh, 18. And it says, they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor preach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So here's Peter, the one that wrote, submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it's the king is supreme or aren't the governors that are sent by him. And yet here he, here he is saying, you judge yourself. Should we obey God or should we obey men? And of course the obvious answer is you obey God. So let me give you one more reference before I explain this over here. But in chapter five, well, first of all, when they went back in chapter 4, they went back to their company. They began to pray and they said, Lord, behold their thre threatenings. And instead of praying against the government, the authority figures over them, what they did was just pray for boldness, that they wouldn't back down, that they would stand and continue to speak the words that God gave them. And as they were praying, the place was shaken and they were filled again with the Holy Spirit. And they went out and they spoke boldly in the name of the Lord. And then in chapter 5, they were preaching again. And let me jump down to verse, uh, this is Acts chapter 5 and verse 18. And it says that the, these are talking about the scribes and the Pharisees, that they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and preach in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Now, they had already been commanded by the authorities in the fourth chapter not to speak in the name of the Lord. Here's the Lord that opened up the prison doors and told them to go speak in the name of the Lord. Now, did the Lord contradict what he told Peter to say over in 1 Peter chapter 2? There has to be some way of harmonizing these things. And drop down here to verse 29. It says, Then Peter, 
And the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. So how do you harmonize this? Here's two examples of Peter standing up boldly and said, You judge yourself, which is right. Should we obey you or obey God? And then the Lord even told him, you go preach, which was directly against the command that the governing authorities had given them. How do you harmonize this? And I got a lot of ground I want to cover, so I'm not going to go into as much depth on this as I could. But I believe one of the ways you understand this is to understand that submission and obedience are not synonymous. Now, they should be if you are submitted to a godly government. But if you have an ungodly government that tells you to do something against the laws of God or in this nation against our God-given constitution that I really believe was a supernatural work of God and it's a blessing that God has given us. And if you have laws that violate God's law, which uh, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We have a command from God to meet together. And I've had some people say, but you know, through uh, internet and through Zoom and live stream, we can now still preach the gospel. And you know, during this virus, we have, uh, we've learned some things and I've, you know, used Zoom more than I've ever used in my life. <laughs> I held uh, meetings in Hong Kong and, uh, man, I forget, uh, Germany and South Africa all in one day with no jet lag. <laughs> it was awesome. And so I'm beginning to learn and do some of those things. And we've, had, we've reached more people than we've ever reached. And there's some good that's coming out of this. But it's not the same as being together. There is a collective anointing that happens when you come together. It says in Matthew chapter 18 that where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of them. He said he'd never leave us nor forsake us, so he's always with us. That's not the issue. But when you get people together, and then you start praising like we did tonight. You know, the Bible says in Psalms chapter 22, I believe it's verse 3, that God inhabits the praises of his people. And when you get people together, there is a collective anointing. Then you go to praising God and God inhabits the praises. And I'm telling you, there are things that happen when we gather together that don't happen when we're by ourselves. We need this. We don't need to just see each other over some medium, some television screen or something. We need to be here and we need to hug each other. Amen. The Bible even says, greet one another with a holy kiss. I know that's not our custom, but that's what the Bible says, amen. I'm telling you, we, the, in the early days they called the assembly, they said that they are spots in your love feast, talking about the people that came against you. And the Christians were accused of having love feast because there was so much love. And I tell you, we need the encouragement of each other. You know, I just saw some stats today that the suicide rate in Teller County is, I forget the exact figure, but it was multiple times, I think five times the average of Colorado. Did you know we need to be meeting together? We need to be loving people. We need to be touching people's lives. And the calls to suicide prevention things have gone up tenfold during this COVID shutdown. There's also a man that uh, recently has come out and said that the economic uh, downturn, the economic damage done by this lockdown is probably going to double the poverty in the, in the entire world in the next year. And they're predicting as many as 20 million to 200 million people dying of poverty and the effects of poverty having on the world while we're sitting here dealing with just a few little things. Am I saying that the virus isn't real? No. Am I saying that, you know, I'm not against everybody because when they were predicting two and three million deaths, nobody knew where this was going. And so out of concern, we all did things that we had to do. But, you know, looking back at this, there has been four deaths from COVID-19 in Teller County. Did you know last year, 2019, there was 198 people that died in Teller County from natural causes? 
198 people. There was 168, I believe, that were born in Teller County. The death rate's higher in Teller County than the birth rate. But there was 198 that died of all causes. There's only been four that died of COVID-19, and yet they've, that's justified locking down the economy. Again, I'm not necessarily faulting us in the beginning, but looking back on it, man, this is just, it's wrong. It's hurting people on all kinds of levels. And there is much more to consider than just people getting sick where only less than 1% of the people who catch it have anything that is serious. Many of them are asymptomatic. Amen. So anyway, my point is that there are things being done that violate God's word about assembling together. We need this. There's much more than just the myopic view of looking at has anybody gotten the virus. I know four or five people that have had the virus and they didn't even realize they had it. But they tested positive. We're looking at the number of cases and in the vast majority they're asymptomatic. You ought to be looking at the number of people that are dying from it, which that number has dropped so dramatically that it's virtually down to nothing. And it's very clear who is uh, susceptible to this. It's people with previous conditions and old folks like me, except, <laughs> praise God, I'm covered by the blood. Amen. So it's not a problem with me. But I am saying that all you have to do is take people that have pre-existing conditions and deal with that and loose everybody else. If we wait on permission to meet together, I guarantee you they are not going to give it to us. So I was getting off on this. There is a difference between submission and obedience. I submit to the government but I am not going to obey anything that's contrary to what Scripture says. And there's a difference. Submission is an attitude. Submission cannot, cannot be forced. You know, I mentioned this in school the other day, but I heard a little story about a kid that was on the front row of a church and he was playing with these cars on the pew while the preacher was preaching and he was going... <clears throat> and all this and he was making noise and it bothered the preacher and finally he just got put out and he said stop and that kid goes <laughs> and then he says now you sit down and shut up and that kid sat down and he had his arms folded like this and he, may, he said I may be sitting down on the outside but I'm standing up on the inside <laughs> now see that's obedience but that's not submission <laughs> submission goes beyond obedience it's an attitude and you can submit to the authority over you without obeying it which again is exactly what happened in the fourth chapter after they were beaten they left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name and they went to the company and instead of forming a revolt, instead of saying, let's overthrow this government, let's get some arms and fight against them. And see, that's rebellion and that's not submitting to the authority. They just prayed that God would give them the courage to go ahead and say and do what God told them to do. And then the Lord even came along and verified it and said, you go back and preach all of these things in the name of the Lord. So they didn't obey ungodly commands, but they didn't rebel at the authority. So when Peter said that we are supposed to submit to every ordinance of man, his own actions showed that he didn't obey it. But you know what? He did submit. He didn't ever fight against them. He didn't ever criticize them. He did tell them the truth that you're the one who crucified Jesus. This blood is on your hands. He told them the truth, but he didn't form a rebellion. I tell you the way that we see some people protesting today and and rioting and breaking things and starting fires and looting and killing people and they think that somehow or another these are peaceful protests that's lawlessness it is completely ungodly that is not the way you resist something in this nation God has granted us the ability to go and redress our government with our complaints and that's what we're doing and we're standing up and I believe it's the right thing to do and I believe it fits completely. I'm not rebellious. If they come and arrest me, I don't want anybody sitting there fighting the police. I want you to sit there and uh, 
you know, just pray for us, but praise God, they aren't going to keep me too long. We can, I could have a jail ministry. Amen. So let's look at another passage of scripture here in Romans chapter 13. Paul was the one writing this, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers for there is no power but of God, the powers that be or ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. I don't believe that this damnation here is talking about like eternal damnation. This word is the exact same word that's translated judgment. It's just talking about that if you resist the authority over you, there's going to be hell to pay. You are going to be, um, you're going to be condemned. For the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. It's implied that if you don't have good, then you won't get praised by them. And that's where we are. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, in other words, because you could be punished for it, but also for conscience sake, so that you could obey the Lord and keep a clear conscience. You know, let me uh, use this verse out of Hosea chapter uh, 4, or excuse me, chapter 8 and in verse 4. This is something that you'll hear people say that They'll take a scripture like this and say that every power, every governing authority is ordained by God. And so therefore anything they say is ordained by God. You'll hear people say that, you know, there's a lot of people that this is the reason they don't vote is because they say, well, it's all, all up to God. It's sovereignty of God. God puts up one, sets down another. It's just up to God whether or not people are in positions of leadership. Look at this in Hosea chapter 8. And in verse 4, it says, They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. So right here is the Lord saying that people put kings and princes in positions of authority, and God didn't have anything to do with it. This thing that God just supernaturally puts whoever, whoever is supposed to be in there. I heard people say that when Obama was elected, that, well, it must have been God's will. He was elected. <laughs> that wasn't God's will. <laughs> Obama is the very first president we ever had that was elected out of nothing but racial prejudice. And uh, I'm not against anybody in any color, but I'm saying there's, a, uh, you know, 98% of blacks voted for Obama. You couldn't get 98% of Christians to do anything together. <laughs> To get 98% of people together means that I guarantee you there was somebody that disagreed but because of the color of his skin they voted for him. And then there was a whole bunch of whites who felt like they were doing some kind of penance and setting the balance straight by voting for Obama. Thank you for that thunderous silence. <laughs> I'm just telling you, God didn't set Obama in. Obama fundamentally changed this nation. And... It emboldened the ungodly. And when Trump came along, Trump has probably passed more godly uh, executive orders, done more things for the body of Christ than any president that I'm aware of in my lifetime, possibly in the history of this nation. And when he did that, all of the people who were loosed by Obama are rioting in the streets and protesting. And that's the reason we see all of this because, man, once they gain that ground, they don't want to give it up. And that's the reason we see this. So anyway, it says that God didn't know about these kings and princes. God doesn't just automatically put people in. There was, tw there was I've heard different uh, figures, but there was over 25 million evangelical Christians who didn't vote in the last election, presidential election. And during Obama's time, I don't know what those figures are, but I can guarantee you there's been a lot of Christians that are AWOL because they don't understand these things. 
And they just think, well, you're supposed to submit to whatever and whatever, whoever God wants in there will, will be in there. Man, that is not true. That is not true. So remember that Paul is the one that wrote these things. God established order. He established law. He established government. And bad government is better than no government. When the Soviet Union fell, did you know that a lot of those nations, I was over in uh, Romania just one month after Ceausescu was overcome and they didn't even have a government yet. Nobody knew what to do. And it was wild what was going on. But did you know in many of these countries that had been under the Soviet Union, under communism, I don't believe communism is a godly system. It's an anti-godly system. And we should be uh, resisting that. But it was better than anarchy. And when the Soviet Union fell apart, there was ethnic cleansing. And there was hundreds of thousands of people killed because there was no government authority. Even the communist authority, which was not good, was better than nothing. And so that's what Romans chapter 13 is talking about. God established government and he intended for them to function for good, but they have to cooperate. Let me use this example that, you know, God established the church and God established in the church order. I don't know how Joe and Tessa set up this church, but if it's a godly church, they should be the absolute head. There's a lot of churches that have deacon possessed churches <laughs> and the deacons run it and the elders run it. That is an unscriptural form of government. So God established the pastor and the pastor is supposed to have absolute authority over the church. If they're a good pastor, they will listen to other people. They will encourage uh, people to share with them and stuff. And I believe that Joe and Tessa do that. But I'm saying that you don't have the right to hire and fire them. You didn't hire them and you can't fire them. I could explain that a lot better, but I need to move on. But anyway, in the church, are all pastors good? No, there are pastors that steal money. There's people that have adulterous affairs and things like that. But does that mean that God is the one who calls them to be crooks and thieves and to have these extramarital affairs? No, God established them as the head, but does that mean that every pastor is using the authority that they've got properly? Certainly not. Every one of us understand that. You just need to apply that to government too. God established government and this government was inspired and directed by God. And I believe it's the best form of government that has ever been on this planet. It is awesome. But does that mean that everybody that's in positions of authority is doing the right thing? No. And you know what? If they get outside of that, just like Peter said, you judge yourself. Should we obey God or should we obey men? And the very man who wrote this in Romans chapter 13, what were his actions? Look at this over in Acts chapter 25. This is where um, Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and as he was being carried into the castle, he asked the captain if he could preach to the people. And um, so he gave him leave. And anyway, they listened to him for a long time until he got to talking about uh, Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. And then they, they had a riot and the captain came and took uh, Paul and brought him into the castle and commanded that he should be beaten so that he could find out what it was that caused these people to be so against him. And look at what Paul did here in Acts chapter 22 and in verse 25 it says, And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Did you know Roman citizens could not be bound without a trial? They couldn't be beaten without a trial. And they had already bound him. They were about to beat him. And if they had done that, whoever did that could have been put to death. The Romans considered that if you did something wrong to one of its citizens, you did something wrong to all of Rome. And so Roman citizenship was a big deal. And Paul used it to stop government authorities from abusing him. This would be similar to going to court to demand his rights. He had rights as a Roman citizen. 
and he exercised them. So here's the same man that said that you're supposed to submit under these governing authorities, and here he is. He he didn't he didn't he wasn't non-submitted, but he was non-compliant. He didn't obey what they said. Instead, he used his right as a Roman citizen. Same thing happened in the 25th chapter. And this is after he had been in prison for two years. And this shows you that he wasn't quick to sit here and do these things. Let me say that the people, the, that myself and the people that are in leadership in my ministry, we aren't quick to do this. I'm not rebellious towards anybody. Man, I'm, I'm a law-abiding citizen. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> but here's Paul, and after he had been in prison for two years, and then Festus was going to send him to Jerusalem, and he knew that the people were just waiting to kill him on the way. You know what? He uh, once again exercised his citizenship in Acts chapter 25, and in verse... Um, what verse is this? Verse 10, it says, Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged to the Jews have I done no wrong uh, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of those things whereof you accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. So here was another thing that a Roman citizen had. They had the right to appeal and stand before Caesar. And of course, the lesser people under Caesar had to evaluate whether it was a just cause. They couldn't take a frivolous case all the way up to Caesar, but it's in a similar way like going to the Supreme Court. And if you demanded that, they had to give you your rights unless they could prove that somehow or another you, you weren't, your case didn't merit it. And so Festus went aside and they talked about it and he said, all right, you've appealed unto Caesar, unto Caesar shall you go. So here's a second example of this man who wrote that all of the authority that's over you is of God and you need to submit yourselves unto him. And here he is using his rights to stand against the authority. Festus was a corrupt man and the Jews had offered him favors if he would send Paul back to Jerusalem and they were going to lie in wait and kill him on the way. And so Paul had to use the uh, things that were available to him to resist that. Let me turn over to the 16th chapter. And in the 16th chapter is where Paul and Silas had been preaching. And uh, they were arrested. They were beaten. They were put in the dungeon, in the darkest part of the dungeon. Their feet and their hands in stocks. And this is where they got to singing and worshiping God, even in prison. And man, God got to tapping his foot as they were singing and an earthquake came and it opened up all of the jail cells and all of the chains fell off, but nobody left. And the jailer came in and he got saved in his whole house. And then the next morning, it says, this is in Acts chapter 16 and in verse um, 35. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeant saying, let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and, and uh, have cast us into prison. And now do they, um, and now do they thrust us out privately, uh, nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. And so here he is once again using his rights as a Roman citizen. This time he didn't stop the beating. We don't know exactly why he did that, but it worked to his advantage. He got arrested and now these people were petrified because they had beaten a Roman citizen. They could be put to death. And rather than him just leaving jail on his own, he said, no, you beat us openly. And we were uncondemned and we're Romans. You come and you take us out yourself. He made them eat crow. <laughs> so these are examples of people who wrote these scriptures that either are in violation of the things that they wrote or it needs to be interpreted in the light of their actions. And I believe the way you do this is that, man, you do not rebel against government. You don't do riots. You don't speak against them. You don't operate in hatred. You don't return evil for evil. 
But we have to stand up. And in this nation, we not only have the kingdom of God that we serve, but we also have a kingdom, a physical kingdom that was given to us by God with rights and privileges that very few people have ever had on this planet. We've been entrusted with something and we have a responsibility to stand up. I believe that there are people in this nation who know exactly what they're doing. Exactly what they're doing. You know, the Black Lives Matter, there's three women who started that. One of them is Prentice Colors, and I've heard her interviewed twice. And she said, they asked, you know, is this just spontaneous? And she said, spontaneous? We are trained Marxists. We know exactly what we're doing. And she said, we are here to overthrow the nuclear family and to do away with America as you know it. They want reparations. They want every single black person to be paid a certain amount of money for life for doing nothing. They want every person released from prison. They want prisons shut down. They're, they're the ones that started to defund the police. And it's just creating instability. It's, I believe that there, there are people that know exactly what they're doing. But there's a lot of people that have just been caught up in it and they may mean well, but they're being misused and abused by these people. But we are in a, we are in a revolution already. It's not coming. It's already here. And these people have been forced out into the open. You know, Trump said he was going to drain the swamp. I don't know if he drained it, but he lowered the water level so that you can see all the critters. He flushed, he flushed a bunch of ungodliness out into the open. And I mean, they are just incensed because they are losing all of the ground that they've gained. The vast majority of Americans are not ungodly in the sense that we see happening, riot and looting and killing people and doing things. That is not the average American. But it was our court system that advanced the LGBTQRSTUV uh, <laughs> agenda. It's the court systems that passed these things that pushed abortion on us when the vast majority of people did not want abortion. And today, I think it's 70 something percent are against, there are at least four limits on abortion. And the court systems have done all of this. And you know, Trump has now appointed over 300 appellate court judges. One, it's either one third or one fourth of all of the appellate judges in this nation are now Trump appointees. And it has scared the liberals spitless. <laughs> and then the Supreme Court, we're right now in the process of trying to confirm another uh, conservative judge. And man, they are just... They're beside themselves because Trump has put limits on them. They've been using the court system to force things on us. And so we are in a rebellion. We are in a revolution. And I tell you, it's, it's time that we stand up. And I would imagine that most of you that go here, you probably, uh, I'm preaching to the choir. You probably agree with the things I'm saying. But in case somebody snuck in here and you got trapped... I'm telling you, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, you ought to be acting like a Christian. You ought to be standing up. God gave us a Christian nation. God gave us a Christian nation, and I tell you, it's not going to stay a Christian nation unless we stand up. I really believe that this is a turning point in this nation. We, it's as critical right now as it was during the time of the Civil War. I really believe that. And if we don't stand up, stand for godly things and speak out, if we, if we give in to things that are unconstitutional, when the very first liberty that was given to us is the freedom of assembly and the freedom of religion, that government cannot restrict our free exercise thereof. That is the foundation principle and everything else is built upon that. John Adams said, if this nation ever ceases to be religious, which in his day, religious wasn't like it is today. I use that term in a derogatory way, but he's talking about if this nation ever ceases to be moral, he says, then there isn't enough laws 
You can't pass enough laws to restrain the evil that's in the heart of man. It says that they will go through it just like a whale goes through a net. That's a quote from John Adams. He says that, a, that democracy is totally unsuited for anybody but a moral people. The church is essential. The church needs to be needing. We are the answer to the suicide rate and to all of these other things. Man, if people are sick, they need to come and call the elders of the church, not sequester in their homes. We need to be meeting. And so these are some scriptural bases that I just wanted to share with you. And you need to be able to defend this because there's a lot of people. I've had people right here in Woodland Park sit there and say, well, Jesus would have never done what you're doing. Jesus would just turn the other cheek. Jesus would do all of these things. They're talking about the same Jesus that made a cat of nine tails and drove the money changers out of the temple twice, not once, but twice. They're talking about the same Jesus that said, you snakes, you vipers. You're, you're wide on the outside like a whited tomb, but inside you're full of dead man's bones. They came and they said, have you heard what Herod said about you? And he said, you go tell that fox. Man, they criticized Trump for calling the MS-13 members animals. Jesus called Herod a fox. <laughs> Scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. There, there's people that are thinking that we should be more godly than Jesus. <laughs> Something's weird with this. I'm telling you, I love this nation. I love God and I love people. And that's the reason that we're going to meet. And you know, we... It's not like we're just rebellious. We've canceled a bunch of stuff. We canceled a musical that we were doing. We canceled our Karis days, our men's advance. We, we turned our Healing is Here conference into a Zoom meeting. But did you know that uh, we didn't turn away people that came? We canceled it, but there was a couple that came. Well, there was an entire family that came from New Zealand. And they flew over here. And when they landed in the United States, the father had a heart attack. And they put him in the hospital. And uh, they wanted to come to the uh, conference. And so they wanted to get their father out of the hospital. And the, and the hospital wouldn't re release him. Said he'll die. He's on life support. He'd had a massive heart attack. So they went to the sheriff and they said, can they keep our father? And he says, no, not if you don't want him to. And so they went back armed with the sheriff and they took their father out of the hospital. They flew here. And when they got here, we let them in. There was, you know, just a few people here, but we let them in as we did most of the conference by Zoom. And uh, anyway, this man couldn't even stand without help. And if he stood, he was out of breath. And just sitting here listening to all of the people minister about healing, this man got totally healed, walked down to our pavilion, walked around. And he's now back in New Zealand and they said he's completely healed, no problems at all. So I'm telling you, we need to be meeting so that people can be healed, so that people can be encouraged. So that marriage is happening. So that our economy can get back on its feet. I'm telling you, there, it's time for the body of Christ to stand up and say enough is enough. Enough is too much. Amen. And this is a godly thing to do. Praise the Lord.
Sau cơn mưa đêm em đã làm gì giờ Khó thuốc lăn lần đi giờ Anh chỉ muốn một đêm này không ngày ai yêu mất được gì Yeah, yeah, em muốn là về và xa mơ Em đã còn đi nhưng mà ba mùi Anh không thể giữ em được bên mình Và bao nhiêu người xóa được người ghen tình Và nhiều người mấy em đã quên rồi Bạn là con má nằm bên tôi Giờ chỉ con má nằm bóng trôi yeah. Anh chẳng thể giữ về cho em Còn cơn mưa cứ đang nhật trôi Và em xa rồi Chỉ còn anh đêm nơi cái mày mờ thôi yeah. Mắt anh đã mà đi mascara Môi hồng như em Grazada yeah. Bạn em như có AK Và hoa là ta 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 Anh bay lên trên trời cao Thôi ngăn đào Chứ mà vì sao